Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and we have a real treat for you today. We are going to talk to Lou Perez, who is a comedian, writer, producer, and actor. Lou was the head writer and producer of the Webby Award-winning comedy channel, We the Internet TV. In addition to producing sketch comedy, performing stand-up, and opinion writing, Lou also hosts the Lou Perez Podcast. He's the author of That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore, on the death and rebirth of comedy. Lou, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I, quote-unquote, met you at Freedom Fest, and by met you, I saw you do stand-up routine at, I think it's called Punching Up, was the after show at Freedom Fest or whatever. And I had a good old time. I bought, I ordered your book and I really enjoyed it. And so I want to bring you on to talk about your book and also to talk about the nature of comedy, talk about what it is for you that draws you to be a comic. Did I say that right? Is that is it called you're a comic? Is that how you refer to yourself? Is that how you identify? Most of the time I say comedian, but oh, okay. it feels like comic is a, like an older term. I don't know. I, I hear oh, a lot of people man. saying comedian. No, 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 no. I, I don't think you're dating yourself or anything like that. Because well, I think nowadays, so many comics do just a ton of different stuff, you know, where mm, it's sort of okay. it might fall under a larger umbrella of comedian. Like I think like Jerry, oh, I see. Jerry Seinfeld, like still, I believe, refers to himself as a comic, you know, even though, okay. you know, he's the most successful sitcom ever, movie yeah. career and and all that. But I think he really sees himself as stand-up comedian first and a comic where I think I started with improv and sketch comedy and then did stand-up. So I, a lot of my comedy is sort of, you know, multifaceted. I don't want it to sound, I don't want to sound like, like I'm, uh, you know, like <laughs> conceited or highbrow. It's just, I, I do a lot yeah. of different comedy, but this is the first time I'm actually thinking like, oh yeah, why do I refer to myself as a comedian as opposed yeah. to a comic? Well, hopefully yeah. you'll have a lot of self-reflection after this conversation. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, so you're also now an author because you, as I can see, because we're not recording this over video, I can see several dozen copies of your book over your shoulder. Somebody's got to buy them. And, yeah, somebody. Uh, that somebody is me. <laughs> <laughs> I likewise have a lot of copies of Faith Seeking Freedom, which is the book that we published in my office, when people order them, I you know put them in the envelopes and ship them out, or the packages and ship them well, out. Well, congrats to you, man. When did you write that book? So it was four of us who wrote it. We published it in late 2020. And yeah, so it's been a big hit. A lot of people have really benefited from it. It helps them get succinct answers to tough questions that a lot of libertarian Christians are asked. So it's some of them are like just questions for libertarians, but a lot of them are like, well, how do I reconcile my faith and my politics if mm-hmm. I want to believe in free market economy and you know, do I have to endorse prostitution kind of questions, those kinds of things. Right, right. Yeah, that's, I don't mean to derail the conversation. No, no, this, this is, no, this is all super interesting to me. Like, actually, the first time that I went to Pork Fest, which was a long time ago, we're probably talking like over 12 years ago. Okay. The first time that I went there, I wasn't, I didn't consider myself a libertarian at the time. And something that, that I was attracted to or interested me was the connection between anarchism and Christianity. And there were a number of Christian anarchists there. So I went with the express purpose or interest in possibly writing something about the connection between, you know, anarchism Ah, and and Christianity. I ended up not writing it. My friend Carla, who at the time was with the Free State Project, she had invited me and, you know, I had a great time, but I was walking around with a notepad and like, you know, taking notes. (laughs) And she said a number of people were like, is this guy a fed? Like, let's go, you know, what's going on here? This guy's, you know, taking notes. Because I was, I was new, you know, I didn't know, uh, it was all new to me. It was this alien world of, you know, liberty loving, yeah. liberty loving people. But no, I, I still, I do find it very interesting to have talks with, you know, Christians like yourself and see that where the connections are. And also, like, like you said, the tensions as well. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, obviously, for any person who's not a libertarian who looks at it and says, well, wait, what about this? What about that? You know, there's a lot of questions that people have. So, yeah, well, let's turn this back on your book and talk to you about what that process was like. I don't, 
I guess a lot of comedians actually do end up publishing books or whatever. But what was behind you saying, I'm going to write this? A lot of it was the opportunity being there. I've always been of the mind. And for my whole comedy career, it's been basically you go where the gigs are and you take Mm. the opportunities that are there and you do the best you can with it. You know, in the book, I talk a little bit about, you know, when you're starting out, especially in stand up, there's no guarantee that this is going to be a good career choice. There's no guarantee that you'll even get a paying gig, let alone make a career out of this. So especially when you're starting, you're, you know, early on, you're looking for, you know, anyone that will give you a stage, anyone that will give you a microphone. And, you know, sort of having that, I don't know, ethos, would it be of, you know, just taking the opportunities that are in front of you and going with it has got me where I am today. And Mm -hmm. the book came out of me writing an article in the Wall Street Journal called How I Became a, quote, far-right radical. And there's a version of it in the book that, you know, goes into a little bit more depth. Basically, it started out by there was an academic paper that was an exploration on the, quote, growth of right-wing echo chambers on YouTube. And one of the channels that was listed as far right was my old comedy channel, We the Internet TV. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. (laughs) And I was in good company too. I mean, also listed as far right was like the Joe Rogan experience and Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein. Wait, wait, wait. Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein were considered far right. Far right. In this frame. Yeah, according to this framing. Sheepers. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to write a response to it and basically say, look, you know, not only is this bonkers, you know, this whole study that you guys have put together, but based on the, you know, the times that we're living in, this could have really terrible repercussions on me and my career, you know, as I'm looking for work and entertainment Mm -hmm. and writing to be labeled far right will often put the image of, you know, white guys in khaki pants carrying tiki torches through Charlottesville. You know, that that's sort mm, yeah. of... That's what a the lot image. Of people, yeah. So yeah, I had the great fortune to be published in the Wall Street Journal. And then from that article, that's what led to the book. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's my how first long, book. How long was that process once you said, all right, I'm doing this, I'm writing, and you have deadlines, I assume, to turn it in. How long was that process? Yeah, so I would have to go back to... You know, sort of like my emails to see when everything happened. But I think, let's see, I was, I think it came out in December of 2020. Mm-hmm. And then it was probably the next month that I talked to the publisher, David. And then from there, I had to put together a proposal. So that took another few months of putting together a proposal. And then they accepted the proposal. And then, like, that's when the writing started. Yeah. Okay. And that's interesting. You know, you, haven't written a book with others, you know, I think that opens up a can of worms too, like as far as, you know, what does a collaboration yeah. look like? Yeah. And for me, I mean, I was basically, I was put in a position where I was asking, my, I was asking my publisher, so like, you know, what do you guys want from me? You know? And he basically said, write the book you want to write, which is an amazing, an amazing gift, but yeah. also so scary because it's like, yeah. wait a minute, write the book I want to write. I don't even know what I want to write, you know? Yeah. And, Give me some options, please. <laughs> Give me a menu. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, what ended up happening was I was like, oh man, I don't think I have enough material for a book. And then as I started going through like, oh, well, here's all the stuff that I have already have like notes on, stuff that mm-hmm. I've wanted to write about, things that have, you know, tickled me, uh, tickled me. And I, I haven't had the time. <laughs> I, now you know, you're dating yourself. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a tickled comic. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And then I found out like, oh man, I have too much. I have way too much to write. So I, so, you know, maybe there's like a, you know, B-sides in there. I still, you know, like you said, I have like 50, 50 copies on my bookshelves right now. There's still a part of me that's like, I can't believe that I actually went through it. I actually did all that. Mm, Yeah. Did you get to decide the order that everything went in? Because it's not entirely sequential, you know, as I was reading it, I was like, well, this didn't have to be said, you know, in this order or whatever. And Sometimes there was a chapter that was like, oh, well, this just was a cool chapter that tickled me. (laughs) I'll be old with you today. So did you get to decide that? And that was the order? Or did your publisher kind of help you shuffle anything? So 
the big issue and probably like the most difficult chapter was the first chapter. Mm -hmm. Because when you're writing a first chapter, especially on, you know, on a specific subject, in this case, you know, comedy over the past, you know, seven years, you really need to frame for the reader what it is that you're arguing and what it is that they can expect from it. So that first chapter took a number of rewrites. And what ended up happening was I took material that was in later chapters and basically like combined it into this first chapter, like sort of weaved Mm -hmm. it in. Mm -hmm. And then once that happened, things started to make a lot more sense. And like you said, you know, some chapters, it doesn't necessarily need to be sequential. And I think that's a fun thing too. If anybody, you know, for those of you looking to buy my book, you can kind of read it in any order you like. But yeah, things just started kind of falling into place with that. And then there were some chapters that didn't make the final cut. I was just like, mm, you know, this doesn't seem to be working or... It's like bonus material if you sign up for my mailing list material, man. That's what it's for. That sounds... Well, Doug, thank you so much, man. You just gave me a great, <laughs> uh, a great idea. <laughs> that's been our strategy. So that's what it was like. Yeah. Now that's cool. Are you... I'm just kind of curious here on a personal note in the writing process. Are you the kind of person, and you can say this about any like sets that you write for stand-up, are you the kind of person that is okay sharing it mid-process? Or do you like to sort of have a like 90% draft done before you like share it with your wife or with a good friend? When it comes to stand-up, I don't mind sharing it or trying it out if it's not all the way there yet. Mm-hmm. But it's different when it comes to the writing. Mm. There's something about writing where I'm just super anal, verging on neurotic when it comes to writing. I'm constantly just pouring over the same line over and over Mm -hmm. again. I used to have a little bit of OCD when I was a kid, like kind of through college. And I would have to say numbers like in my head. Like I would have to be like 17, 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, 20, 17, 18, 19, 20, in order to like feel normal at at some points, depending on the situation. It's very odd. I got over that somehow. But it there's sort of that latent OCD when it comes to yeah. uh, when it comes to writing. So when I'm sharing something with others, I it's close to where I think it's either done or I can't really go further. I need help. Mm, yeah. On this. Yeah. Okay. So then you send this book off to your publisher, and you know, in my mind, it's like, all right, you're going to publish it next week, right, or next month, or you know, a couple months. But it it obviously takes a lot longer. Oh, yeah. Is that like agony to like just wait it on it in their hands, especially once they even say, all right, we're done, no more edits? Yes. And one of the reasons why, what made it, you know, particularly aggravating or I don't know, I don't know if, ag- if aggravating is the right word, but anxiety inducing mm-hmm. was the fact that there were so many comedians passing away. So, you know, as I'm writing this, you know, I turned in the first draft. We're coming up on a year. October 20th, 2021. And uh, I think after that, I forget which comedians died in September when it was just leading right up to me having to turn this in. And then more comedians died after the draft was in. So like Gilbert Gottfried passed away and Louis Anderson, these incredible comedians that I had grown up with and looked up to. And then there was the notorious slap from Will Smith on Chris Rock. And, you know, so these really big controversial things happened in comedy and friends are reaching out to me like, oh, you got to write a chapter on this. And I'm like, please stop. Like, just, I just don't want anything else to happen in the world. It was very selfish of me. (laughs) You know, I was like, please, (laughs) please, God, don't take any more comedians. Yeah. Not until this book (laughs) is out because I cannot, you know, I can't do another rewrite. Well, it's not like people aren't going to come to you and be like, you're going to have to write another book now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to tell you to keep writing about it. It's like, oh, that's sad. Because like there's, it seems to me that there is a sense of reverence and community. Even if you've never like maybe personally shared a beer with any of these people, there's that sort of respect and reverence and community that happens in the comedian community. I'm going to get my terms right here. And so it seems to me that for someone like you and, and this is just me sort of trying to understand the mind of a comedian and, and what makes them tick, right? Is that there is more to it than just being funny. I like to be funny. I consider myself funny. I, my kids might not. I have a question about being a dad and 
and stuff <laughs> in a little bit when we talk a little bit more about some practical things with comedy. But I like to think of myself as funny, but I'm not sure I'm into stand-up as in like I would ever want to try to do that. But there's something about it that's very alluring to me in that there is something there that is very meaningful. It isn't just about being funny. So I don't know if you want... I don't have a question there for you, but I'm sure you can respond. Yeah. Well, I think one thing too that was sort of you know agonizing about waiting for the book to come out was you know wanting the material in it to be fresh or evergreen you know yeah and the way things you know happen with comedy you know you're if you're commenting on something that happened a week ago in a way like you're sort of late to it you know now imagine trying to comment on stuff that happened 3 or 4 years ago and trying to decide what import that has now you know today so there was something there that was like, oh man, I just please get it out there so people can start reading this so they know that, you know, so it's fresh for them. And I think that's part of the way that I see comedy. It's not for me just about making people laugh. It's making people laugh with material that I have created from making people laugh from my original perspective, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's like a big component of it that I get to share the way that I see the world with people and I get to make them laugh while doing it. Yeah. You know, and with that, I think there's, you know, incredible amount of risks that you take. And in the book, I write, (laughs) I write about, you know, a couple of times of bombing of just, you know, what could have been just like, forget about career ending, just like life ending bombing Mm, on, on stage in front of people because you're putting yourself out there you know, and being willing to, you know, stand in front of an audience and risk embarrassing yourself. Yeah. You know, is a really big part of it. And like, there's there so many people like, you know, you describe yourself, there's so many people like you love to hang out with because there's such a great time. And, you know, they're always laughing. They're making you laugh. They're having great conversation. And they have no aspirations whatsoever of trying to do that to a room full of strangers or the, you know, billions of people that, you know, you can connect with online. And I understand that. I understand why you wouldn't. You would uh, well, they're my friends. They talk. think I'm funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course, they think I'm funny. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I was actually going to ask you about the whole bombing experience. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people might want to ask, what is that like? And I'm not the kind of person that could handle that very well. And I've done public speaking in front of people and I guess that's what public speaking is in front of people. I've done public speaking in like larger crowds and, you know, it's nerve wracking and you want people to like you or whatever, but I don't think I could handle the, I'm up here to perform for you. And if I get it wrong, I'm going to be feeling humiliated or, I mean, that might be the worst part of it is feeling humiliated or whatever. But it does seem to me though, that the environment where people are going into like have drinks or open mic nights or whatever, and like you get up and I'm just like, are people just really that brutal? And like they demand that every single thing, every single moment that you speak, they just have to be, you know, gut rolling laughing? Like, or is it just sort of like they know that they're part of the vibe of we're just going to be honest and you know, laugh or not? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's going out to have a good time, mm. you know? And very early on, before I'd even tried stand up, the first time I ever tried stand up actually was at this show called Gut Bucket. And it was a late show at the UCB Theater. And it was hosted by Pete Holmes. And mm-hmm. for anybody out there who might not be familiar, I mean, Pete Holmes is just a hilarious comedian. He's fantastic. And he's a really nice guy, too. People might know him I've, from, I've, from what the show on HBO? Yeah. People might know him from yeah. that. Like, he's just like yeah. that. He's such yeah. a good guy. Yeah. And I took an improv class with him. And he was hosting and it was like my first time and there's a lottery and, you know, I'm kind of, I'm going to reveal something like, let's just say that we made sure that I got up that night and it was, <laughs> it was the first time, <laughs> it was the first time that I ever, um, you know, you're on, on mic right now, right? I know, I know. <laughs> I stole an election, basically. I, you know, I tampered oh, with, man. you know, with the lotto, but so people, you're a Democrat. Is that what you're admitting? Ooh, shots fired. But something that that Pete did, canceled for that. <laughs> something Pete had told me that stuck with me, and I'm probably paraphrasing. And he said something along the lines of, "Look, if you're up there having fun, they're going to have fun." And it's, I think, mm. you know, giving that kind of energy. So, oh well, yeah. What, what, what was the original question? I'm sorry. No, it had to do with it had to do with the experience of bombing and like that interaction with the oh, audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 
as far as what the audience wants. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people are out there to have a good time. I think now, especially with stand up and, you know, stand up comedians, many of them having like podcasts, they have this relationship with their audience where the audience feels like they know them. And in many ways, they do. So I think when a lot of people go to see like, you know, Joe Rogan or, you know, Tom Segura and, you know, other comedians, they're in a way going to see their friend who they like a lot. Yeah. And, you know, they want to hear what that their helps. friend has to say. And a lot of it is because they built this relationship with them, yeah. which I think, you know, might be different than the way things were before, where the only access you had to a comedian was you had to go either see them live or wait right. for a special to come out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the content of your book. And obviously it's personal in a number of ways. You share stories about things and that have happened in your life. But there's this sort of the evergreen part of this is that there is something going going wrong with comedy in general. And I think a lot of us sort of can sense that because, and I don't know, I think I heard this either Michael Malice or Jordan Peterson or in their conversation that I heard that the left progressive cult sort of going after what comics say or what comedians say is the canary in the coal mine for sort of cultural decline of free speech. So I don't know who I can attribute that to, but you attest to a lot of that happening in some of the stuff that you talk about in your book. You talk a lot about woke and how woke really isn't funny or there's a lot of opportunity there or it's a gift the way Trump was a gift to comedians. So Speaking as a comedian, what is wrong with the world of comedy right now? Hmm. I think one of the things that's wrong is just the super political idea of like the personal is political, you know, and like just taking that to the nth degree where anything, whether it be, you know, something like a joke or a, an observation can be seen as like a personal attack on the person. You know, and especially when we, you know, start talking about things like punching up versus punching down with protecting classes of people who are somehow, you know, above any criticism. And I think that's one of the problems that we're facing. And you see it, too. I mean, it'd be one thing if it was like, you know, all the comedians against the world, you know, where it's like, no, man, we're comedians and we're going to hold a mirror up to society. We're going to take on your sacred cows and we're going to stick together and free speech is so important. But, you know, you see a lot of examples of comedians turning on other comedians. Something that I described is one of the great things about cancel culture are the murder career suicides where you have comedians who will go after others, you know, and point out the flaws and, ooh, you had this off-color joke that wasn't racist in 2016, but is racist today, you should be canceled. And then that person opens themselves up to people going rummaging through their old tweets and their old routines. And then they find out like, oh, wait a minute, but you said this terrible thing about women, you know, not too long ago. And then it's like, oh man, you just, you know, you try to destroy that person's career, but ended yeah. up, you know, getting your own. So I think it was, a, you know, it was a bunch of things there. I don't know if, uh, if you want to unpack any of that. Yeah, well, I mean, it just seems crazy to me that people like Dave Chappelle would be sort of labeled as a white supremacist, which is kind of weird. It's so weird. Yeah, like the personal is political and like everything seems to be political and people take every little thing personally. And I mean, there is a sense in which there is a limit to how you can speak about somebody and go too far. And I've often wondered, this is another question I was hoping to ask is, at what point is there a limit to where you're like, you know what, I'm not going to make fun of this person or this disability or this or whatever? Or do you just have to really be that good to where it's so magical, no one cares that you're drawing attention to, you know, something that is sensitive to a person that might be sitting there in the audience or might be related to a person who's in the audience or, or whatever. So, I mean, do you have personal limits where like, you know, I'm just not going to make jokes about abortion or I'm not going to make jokes about whatever, you know, something that's really sensitive? I mean, there's definitely been times where I've held back on a joke or putting something out there. There are things like, you know, as I've become a father that, you know, there's stuff that I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily laugh at that, you know, maybe I would when I was younger. So the joke isn't funny to you anymore? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I'm fine with you guys telling it. 
So <laughs> continue to tell it. I'm not going to try to go. I'm not going to call your boss. It's like losing your flavor. It's like losing a taste for beer and be like, you know, I moved on to wine. Yeah, it's similar. And, you know, something that, that I try to do is, especially if there's a subject that means a lot to me, is I try to see, well, how can I make fun of this? You know, what kind of fun can I make of it? So, for example, you know, I'm a libertarian. And it's like these principles of like, the, you know, non-aggression and voluntary exchange and, you know, et cetera, are really important to me. But I also have a lot of material where I make fun of libertarians and libertarianism. You know, like, for example, I say the, the problem that libertarians had with the Holocaust was that it was carried out by the state and not the free market, right? Which is right on the money for a libertarian joke. We know it's a joke. We know it's a joke. Yeah, you and I know it's a joke. Please don't tell that to a progressive crowd. <laughs> exactly, because they're, <laughs> they're just going to go. With, but like, for example... No, they're going to write an article in The Atlantic about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a friend of mine who I talked to about... He's somebody I respect a lot. He has a podcast, Hollywood in, in Toto. Christian Toto, his name is. And we did like a joint podcast where... You know, we were talking about both of us had books. Mine was, you know, going to be coming out. And he'd been following me for, you know, for a while. And he noticed that, you know, over the past, like, you know, probably a couple of years that I had gone from, you know, what he felt was sort of like, I could always tune into Lou's stuff to see kind of like a lighthearted, you know, fun kind of comedy. And he's like, you know, I've noticed sort of like a darkness creep in. And it was really important to hear that because, you know, I didn't notice it. I had to be told, you know, I and and especially health, if it's by someone you, you respect. And something that I noticed is definitely over the past couple of years, there has been a lot of darkness that has seeped into my comedy and also my responses you know, to the world. I think a lot of that has to do with having gone through the pandemic. A lot of it has to do with a sense of isolation in a way, you know, having been stuck inside. So much of my life lived online and producing stuff online and so much communication being done with faceless people on the you know on the other side of screens that I think mm -hmm. you know there is a dark element there. But what I'm hoping to do is break through that darkness with comedy, with wit, with even if it's like a real you know sardonic takes. Like like for example, and I've talked about this before on, on other shows. I'm pro life, and re recently I made a joke about Herschel Walker. So it, it apparently it's the rumors are that Herschel Walker, while he says he's, you know, pro-life. He's a is, candidate for, I don't know where. Yeah, is, is he it, running is it, for something? Is it Congress or Senate? I don't yeah. know. See, he's running for office and he was a football player and he's been staunchly pro-life. I think that's the... Yeah, and he came out and the rumor is that he paid for an abortion, at mm -hmm. least one abortion. And then one of his kids took to Twitter... And his son has like a very large following and basically called his dad a liar and said, you know, you're an embarrassment and all that. And, you know, I tweeted out, you know, from a PR angle, Herschel Walker aborted the wrong child, you know, from a P. <laughs> and I expected that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And that is a messed up joke. I under, you know, I understand that it's a dark joke. It's about a subject that, you know, that means a lot to me. But. From a PR angle, aren't I right a little bit? You know, don't don't I? Yeah, you know, the yeah. way that these politicians run their campaigns, like you know, the way that you know, whatever PR people that that are talking to them, I think I'm right. So hopefully that makes yeah, the, the dark humor is tough for me because I I've had a few moments of dark humor myself. In fact, I'm remembering one that I came up with and told a few people, and they thought it was funny, and I'll share it with you afterward. But based on what you just said. <laughs> It was like, oh, wow, this is so funny, but I can't share it with anybody. Mm. Where I guess, I don't know, maybe if you're a comedian, you get to sort of hone it and share it. Whereas for me, I just move on and, you know, call myself funny and, <laughs> and be happy in that, I suppose. Or you have the people that you can share it with. You know, yeah. like, like, for example, you and I talking on this podcast, you told me earlier, it's a, you know, kind of like PG. I'm fine with that. I can't imagine being the type of person who's going to be invited into your home and I accept that invitation and you say, well, here, you know, you know, here are the rules. And then I decide, no, man, I'm going to play this game the way I play it, you know, or um, yeah, right. it's yeah. just, you know, there are jokes that I would tell my parents and jokes that 
I would keep very far away from my parents, you know? So, yeah. no, I think a lot of that makes sense too. And it's important too. Isn't it important to have these different regions of your life where the way you are with your kids is different than the way you are with your guys at your boys yeah. at work or the guys you grew up with? Whereas now it's almost like, and, you know, kind of going back to, you know, one of the problems with, you know, with comedies, you're dealing with people who want everything to just be in, you know, it's kind of the same, the same realm. Yeah. Your personal life, what you do in your bedroom is subject to, I don't know, but political, I hate this word, politicization. Politicization. Yeah, yeah. You could do, if you guys can overdub me or somebody else saying that word correctly. Um, we'll, we'll try to grab a uh, clip of Donald Trump saying the word. Wonderful. But yeah. Well, do you ever tell a joke and like, let's say it just totally kills and you're thinking, man, I hope my mom doesn't watch the video of this or my dad or it seems to me that I couldn't tell just because if I were in your shoes, I would be like, well, okay, I know I'm just telling just a room full of strangers, but like it's getting recorded. Right. And like if one of my parents is like, hey, I want to see how Luke is doing. I, I, actually, I used to host a, podcast called Unsafe Space. And it was a live show where we had comedians and experts. We would perform in front of an audience and do stand up on, you know, the topic of the day, say like climate change or immigration. And then we would do like a panel discussion and Q&A. And it was a really fun show. We used to do it out, out in LA. And there was one that we did on immigration. So I did this whole bit about like my dad being an immigrant. And then I did this other bit, which I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go into. I talk about I mentioned it in the book that, you know, it was rather blue and it involves, it, it, the subject matter is my mom and my dad. And what's so funny is somebody on YouTube was just so horrified by that routine that they had to comment mm. and say, you're disgusting using your parents in such a way as, you know, comedic fodder. You're a garbage son. Just like, you know, just like Ooh. all this stuff. And, you know, I'm like, if my parents saw that, I think they would be okay with it. But at least I'd, I, you know, at least if they weren't, you know, I, I would, you know, hope to be able to explain to them, like, you know, this is coming from a place of love. You know, it's not coming yeah. from a from a place. I don't get, you know, whatever issues I have with my parents, I'm not trying to deal with them in my stand up. You know. Yeah, you're you're not making the fact that they messed you up part of your routine. Like, <laughs> right. I mean, I've seen, com I'll I've just seen comedians up. do that on stage. They're, you know, they make their daddy issues, you know, part of a joke and there's a bit about it, you know, and so, but you're not, yeah, I can see you're not doing that in what you've written. So <laughs> I have to ask you just a handful of questions here, like that's sure. sort of about comedy. You can elaborate however much you want. Do you think Donald Trump is a funny person? Yeah, I think he's funny. You know, he's definitely, you know, brutish at some point points, but I mean, you can't deny, I mean, what that guy's able to do in front of, you know, crowds of thousands and, and riff and, you know, get people laughing and also the energy that he has. I mean, people forget that he's in his seventies mm -hmm. and, you know, he was still, you know, traveling around and performing in front of crowds. And he had a, a number of things that legitimately made me laugh. I think calling, was it Kim Jong-il? What's the son's name? Kim Jong-un? Kim Jong-un. No. Maybe. I don't know which one came first. Well, but. Actually, we don't have to know his name because when Trump called him Rocket Man, I thought that was just, I thought that was hilarious, man. Or Pocahontas. Right. Like, <laughs> I mean, for, I mean, that's legit funny. Yeah, what he did with Elizabeth Warren was pretty trollish and it was, yeah, it was pretty legit. I feel like, and look, I'm not, I mean, we don't talk a lot about candidates on this show, but like, I was not a fan of Trump, mm -hmm. didn't vote for him. And yet... I also thought there were so many things that he did that were sort of like, oh, that's awkward. And either he thought it was funny, other people thought it was funny. There was an inside sense of like, there's some humor in there. But like, of course, the media takes him seriously because it's on Twitter, you know, or because he says this thing. And then like, of course, they want to take him out of context. But I feel like his humor and his sort of wit was vastly misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on there. I'll leave that. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. Doug said Donald Trump was vastly misunderstood. He's a libertarian. He's a Christian. And he has the nerve to say that. Just take that. Take that little soundbite and just share yeah. that with the. All right, all right. We'll just do that. We'll plug that at the beginning of this show <laughs> before people listen to the entire thing. So I think you have two kids now, right? Yep. I have two kids. Do they understand your humor yet? 
I don't think they're old enough based on when you've written this and published it. I don't know how old they are. No, they don't. I mean, what was funny was, especially with my oldest, as he was growing up, he's only two as he was growing up. <laughs> I couldn't make him laugh. your two-year-old, my yeah. oldest, as if my he's oldest. like a te- like <laughs> <laughs> My <laughs> eldest son. You know, the one who will get all, you know, who will receive everything in no, my you will. need to start calling him your eldest. My eldest. My eldest, it took him a very long time to even start laughing at me. Mm. My wife would crack him up and... You know, wow. I was just, yeah, I was just like, he's just not, he's just not ready for it yet. <laughs> and then now the little guy, the youngest, he was actually born, what was a week after I, I turned my book in, after I yeah. he was born okay. seven days after. So he's coming up on a year. I'm able to make him smile now, which is so great. And that's uh, cool. like doing a little tickle under the neck, you know, that gets him rolling with laughter. And that's good for me. I guess I'm a physical comedian. That's what I have to do. If I have to tickle my little <laughs> baby's neck to get him yeah, yeah. laughing, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Do you plan on telling dad jokes or are you going to try to avoid that as they get older and, you know? Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't even know if you can avoid it. Doesn't it just happen? Like, doesn't just, well, I've always it doesn't what, just what, come out like a I've always like wondered what a real comedians thought of people who tell dad jokes because they're very much based on like wordplay and right. like corny humor. And it's like that stuff would, I mean, maybe that's going to be like your outlet of, you know, getting <laughs> getting your dad jokes out on your kids and then you tell real comedy at night. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Or, or, you know, I come up with like some dirty dad jokes or something like that, you know, so I'm on brand so people know what they're getting. Ah, okay. Yeah. That would probably fly better with adults. <laughs> yeah. Because it'd be like, dude, did you just not tell this to your kids today? Because mm-hmm. I think you brought the wrong piece of paper <laughs> to your hand or whatever. So in some of the stuff that you've done... and. It, I've been calling you or talking more about like your stand up or whatever. Like you've done a lot of other things. You've done sketch comedy, you've done some videos online. What's some of the nature of those and like what are you most proud of? Yeah. So I was fortunate to get into making comedy videos sort of at the beginning of YouTube. And that was great because there was a time where you could just type in the search bar comedy and like, my videos would pop up, you know, like that was, you know, that was pretty cool. So ones that I'm very proud of, there's one called Wolverine's Claws Suck. And that's a Greg and Lou video. It has like over 19 million views on YouTube. And I think it still holds up after all these years. It's been like 13 or 14 years or something like that. And I'm very proud of that. I'm like, I'm okay if that's all I'm remembered for. Like, I'm fine with that. We still have I can't tell you the amount of comments that still come in. People like, I was eight years old when I first saw this and it scared me. And now I'm back again. <laughs> or, you know, hey, I first saw this in, you know, in 2010. You know, I can't believe that it popped up yeah, again. Yeah. That's something that I'm really proud of. And there's a number of things that I made with We the Internet TV that I'm really proud of. One of them, uh, ESL students learn new gender pronouns. I like that one a lot. Um, I did a number of, Comedic monologues too over there that I'm proud of. Yeah, so there's a number of, there's a lot of stuff floating around and sort of with with the nature of creating online content, something that I found is like I never really took the time to enjoy like sort of the fruits of my labor because I was always on to the next thing. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, I put all this work into this four minute video, but I got to get another one out, you know? So, you know, in a way, the book was an opportunity to look back and enjoy these really important moments in my in my life and in my development that are still out there that still exist. I can still go and watch these videos that I still like. That was a good part of the writing the book too. Yeah. So one last thing I want to ask you about or just have you comment on, there's a quote in your book near the end and you're telling a story about getting back together with somebody who you had a sort of a fight on Twitter with and what I underlined as I was reading your book was that person behind the avatar is incredibly talented. And you're drawing attention to the fact that this is a real person, not just some rando on the internet. Yeah, we were casting a video and I was talking to my director and I brought up this actor, his name, and my director said, oh, but didn't you guys just have a fight on Twitter? And it really just took me aback and kind of grossed me out. 
the idea that because I had, you know, a fight, quote unquote, with this guy on Twitter, that I wouldn't work with him, you know? And it's like, but wait a minute, let me remember who this guy is. He's a guy who in real life, I had nothing but good interactions with. A guy who was actually like a big supporter and helped us out when we needed it. And the guy, like I said, you know, like, like you just read in the quote, is a really talented guy. Like he would make this project better just by being in it. Mm. And the idea that I wouldn't work with him, you know, because of this, you know, new culture of, you know, ditching people because we might disagree on something. It's just not something that I wanted to be a part of. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, if you got to live the world the way you want it to be, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> in a way, yeah. sort of like li live, you know, if it's like, you know, try to live as principal the life as you can. And I don't know, you know, things being what they are today, if, you know, how many people perhaps decided not to work with me because, you know, of a similar situation. Yeah. But, you know, you can't really dwell on that. And I could be like, well, hopefully I'm never in a position where I'm like, man, I just, you know, I just need somebody to give me a break because I don't want to be uh, in that yeah. position. I'd much rather be in a position of like being able to cast people and to work with others and, and providing the open door to even people yeah. who, you know, I quote unquote have fights with on Twitter. Yeah. It is an inspiring sort of way to think. You know, your whole book is talking about how people are not, whole, it's not all about this, sorry. Throughout the book, <laughs> I should say. You're, you're talking about how, you know, there's a lot of divisiveness and there's a lot of politicization of things that don't need to be politicized and people taking things, you know, way too far and too personally and whatever. And it's like, this could really divide us. And in, I mean, I just did an interview with somebody about critical race theory and wokeism. And it's like, it's in the DNA to be divisive. And for mm. you to say, no, I'm not going to simply divide because we had a fight on Twitter. You right. know? <laughs> All right. and, and fight might even be too strong of a word. Right? Oh, yeah. We had an argument and it was, you know, all caps or something, you know, like, like yeah, in, in the middle of us doing other things. Like we were yeah, both right. probably shopping at, you know, different, yeah. <laughs> different supermarkets. And in between, you know, deciding what cereal we were going to get, we managed to type out a few arguments back and forth. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And there's a very real human person there that we can connect to. And so that's what you were trying to do. So where can people buy your book? And where can they find you online? I guess that'd be, where's your website? And then they can buy your book from there, I guess. Yeah. You guys can hit me up and find everything out about me. Weird. That's a weird thing to say. Not everything. But check it out. com. And the book is That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore. If you can buy it off of Amazon, that would be so helpful. And if you enjoy the book, please leave a review. You know, we're dealing with algorithms here and it really helps if you leave a five star and some nice words. But obviously, I got to earn those words. So if you buy the book, I hope you enjoy the read. Yeah, well, you've earned it with me and I appreciate you coming on, Lou. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. 